What got you there with got you got you What got you there with Shonda Laney? Hi, I'm Sean Delaney, and on this episode of What Got You There, I sit down with legendary chef Mark Murphy. We talk all about what got him interested in becoming a chef, who he's learned the most from, what he does day to day to keep on top of his game, how he handled and overcame dyslexia, and so much more. Mark, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing today? I'm, uh, you know, hanging in there during the uh, pandemic, so to speak. We're uh, doing uh, good. Doing good. See, I feel like we're getting we're on the other side of the tunnel right now. We're good. Fantastic. Yep. Finally, finally light at the end of that tunnel. You have a very interesting story, very interesting background. Uh, of course, you, you've achieved success um, in, in multiple domains. I, I view it both being a chef, entrepreneurship, and, and so many things. And I'm always intrigued by the backstory. And I know you lived in a number of different countries prior to being in age 12. So I would love to know, was there a spot that you lived that was just most formative for you? Wow. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I'm not sure if I could say there's one spot that was more formative because I lived in different countries and different cities at different times of my life, which I think was the big, you know, I think that when you're, when you're 13, you're absorbing different things than when you're 16. Right. So for example, like, I mean, I, I was probably, you know, I would think I was about 14 or 15 when I got my first Vespa and I lived in Rome um, and, and got my freedom running around Rome. I definitely learned things, probably things I shouldn't have been learning sometimes, but, you know, it was different uh, at that point. But, you know, the one thing I did learn throughout my life was um, moving around a lot was you have to figure out how to get along with people very quickly because, you um, you know, when my father being an American diplomat and moving every two or three years, it was sort of like every time, every two or three years, I was starting over as well. It wasn't just my parents starting over, but I had to figure out how to, uh, you know, make things work, uh, you know, friendships um, and so on and so forth. How do you think that's helped you out when opening a new restaurant and understanding that, I mean, so many different types of customers coming through that door? I, I think it really sort of set me up for uh, the ability to get along with anybody. Um, and I think that in, in business, sometimes that really is a, uh, especially in the restaurant business. I mean, I have to be able to figure out how to talk to the dishwashers, the bus boys, the, the line cooks, the sous chefs, the general managers, and then all the way up to the customers, um, you know, who could be from any walks of life as well. And having the ability to be able to just pop into a conversation and, I want to say charm them or at least, uh, you know, maybe customers you're trying to charm I mean, even a dishwasher or a busboy you're trying to charm in a way to get them to do what you want them to do or explain to them what they want you to what you want to do to be able to do their job. So there's a, there's an ability to sort of you you become sort of a chameleon and being able to sort of uh, transform yourself into um, a different person. Um, but still be your you're, you're still yourself, but you, you definitely have to be able to. Uh, endear yourself upon upon people very quickly let's say yeah i'm sure that's the case uh, i know we were talking about the different countries and everything like that what about if you had one last place that you could travel what, where's your favorite place in the world to travel i'd say it's rome yeah rome is my um is my place <clears throat> yeah R rome is one of those cities that is um i, I guess I, I lived there more than once i went to boarding school there when i was in seventh and eighth grade just on the outskirts of Rome, on the Via Aurelia. Um, and then I moved there again when I was, uh, later on in life, when I was uh, probably like 16, 17, 18, around there. Um, and, you know, food is everything for me in a certain sense. Uh, and, and the food in Rome is just, uh, I, I could you know, say, all right, I'll just stay here the rest of my life. It's fine. I can eat, I can eat food in Rome and not be bored. And, and just, I just love it. Love it. And the people, the people in Rome, I mean, it's, um, it, it's a, uh, it's a very laid back uh, society. I find there, there's, you know, there's still that city aspect, but there's still a, a relaxedness about it, which I love. Thinking about the, the food in, in Rome, if you're getting one last meal there, what are you, what are you having? I mean, I'm probably going to be in Trastevere and I'll probably get myself, uh, you know, a little, uh, a little uh, carbonara because it's my favorite dish. <laughs> Very nice. You can't go <laughs> but there, wrong there. But, 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 you know, it's, it's great about the one great thing about Rome is so many things come there because you've got, you know, just an hour and a half to you're in the mountains in the middle of the country, basically, or in, in Umbria, right? You've got all the great stuff going on there. 
20 minutes the other way, you've got the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, uh, sorry, the Mediterranean. 20 minutes the other way, you got the Mediterranean with all this great seafood that comes to Rome as well. So there's great seafood restaurants. There's great, there's, and there's, uh, there, there's restaurants that sort of represent other regions of Italy in Rome. Obviously, it's the capital. So they, they're, you can sort of bop around and, and taste different things. That's one of the things, Mark, I, I really appreciate about you. I mean, you have this interesting origin story where you're the culmination of all these different places and these different experiences. So I'm wondering for you, when, when was that moment where it clicked, where it said, you know what, I think I want to go down the path of, of at least trying to become a chef? You know, I was I was a terrible student. Um, I'm, uh, I, was, I was constantly either being told I was very stupid or uh, couldn't sit still long enough to understand anything and told um, I was never really going to be accomplished much in life. So when I finally struggled my way through and got a graduation, got finally graduated after I think my 11th or 12th school, uh, not only did I move around a lot, I also got kicked out of some schools, which uh, was always, uh, you know, made things a little bit more difficult uh, for myself. But so I moved to New York and I was crashing on my brother's couch at the time. And I was, he had a girlfriend and I was basically, I was a handyman. I was, I, I, she had some tools. I bought some tools. She was a native New Yorker. She knew a lot of people like people who was people's uh, friends who were having babies and needed a baby room painted or a closet built or something done. And I was always pretty handy. I, I had always been, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good with fixing things and um, it's sort of, understood that world so i started doing that and i got kind of, god this is really boring i was really you know, I was, you know it wasn't very much what i wanted to do and since i was living with my brother his girlfriend at the time i felt bad because i wasn't paying rent so i would cook dinner almost all the time i would go shopping i would make dinner and i, I do remember she my uh, my his girlfriend at one point actually years ago years later she goes remember you were on that souffle kick i mean i made a souffle every night a cheese souffle <laughs> a child, like, what, what was with that you know it was just i was just i was just interested in cooking um but i was i wasn't i don't know if i was really interested in cooking but i was interested in eating i always loved to eat i loved food and i thought it, literally in the back of my mind, and it's like, you know, I, I don't think I'd be mind being homeless, but I definitely don't want to be hungry. So yeah. that's when it sort of dawned on me that, wow, if I learn how to cook, and my brother had actually gone to this cooking school called Peter Kump's New York Cooking School at the time. And he was a student at Columbia University, and he was always very good. At, he was completely the opposite of me in the, uh, in the education department. He was always a genius, and everybody loved him, and he got scholarships everywhere. He went to Columbia. But he went to this cooking cooking school where he would work two days and get one day free of classes. And he says, why don't you try to go to this cooking school? So I went to the cooking school. Um, it was a three month cooking school. It sort of, they showed you everything once. And I was like, Hey, this is fun. Like you can make a living doing this. This is kind of cool. So I got, I got kind of jazzed about it. For, for you, what, what was the most fun element of that? Is it the, well, it was, it was for me, I think one of the first times in my life that I was going to a school, you know, in quotes, because it was a cooking school. I didn't, nobody really considered it like a real thing back then. It's like, oh, you're going to cooking school. My, my parents certainly didn't approve. Uh, it wasn't an educational, you know, I wasn't studying to be a lawyer. So it didn't seem like school to anybody else. But to me, it was the first time that I was doing something right. Like the teacher would come over and go, Good job. Like I had never heard that in school before. <laughs> like I had never, nobody ever told me I did anything right. But it was interesting because I basically all of the, um, I would say all of the physical, I don't know if they call it that, but like I, anything that I had to make or physically do, I did, I always got 100%. And then it came down to the written tests because every once in a while there was a written test at cooking school. Forget about it. I did terribly. But everything, all of the practical tests, I guess that's what they call them. For the practical things, I always, you know, pass with flying colors. And I can still remember my final exam. The final exam was they gave you a menu, they gave you the ingredients, and they gave you recipes that might or might not work. And they sit you, they put you in a room upstairs, a kitchen upstairs where you had to do everything. And I remember cooking for Peter Kump, who was the head of the school and my teacher at the time, Catherine Alpert. Um, and I went up there and I banged it out i made i made the meal i set it up i cleaned everything up i went downstairs i'm like is any you guys going to come and have your dinner or lunch i forgot what it was they're like you're done already i was like yeah I wa they walked in and it was everything was ready the kitchen was spotless everything had been cleaned up they were sort of like wow you, you worked quickly 
It's like, well, yeah, I, you know, I probably wanted to go out that night or something. You know, it's probably a new club opening I wanted to go to. I was a young kid in New York. I'm like, let's go. Let's get this over with. Let's, get this. let's kind of move it along. And, uh, you know, I got a perfect score on that test from, from what I remember. I'm wondering for you, was that the first moment where I don't want to say justify, but it was, oh, wow, there might be a real career here for me? No, I don't think it, it didn't dawn on me yet. At that point, I thought, you know, I was, it was like digging dishes, really. I was like, okay, this will be a job. And uh, I was, I always thought, you know, the bonus here is that I won't be hungry. You know, if I'm cooking, let's say the pasta station in a restaurant at the end of the night, I can always sneak myself my own bowl of <laughs> pasta and I'll be cool. So, so then when, when was it? I'm just wondering what, what are next steps for there? I'm even thinking about if someone's, this doesn't have to pertain to, to people specifically looking to become a chef, but there, there's these moments, right? Where all of a sudden you start putting some work, you get a little bit of steam. And I'm wondering when it clicks for you that, you know what, I, I'm onto something here. I think if I put in more work, I can be very talented at this. Well, it, it's sort of, you know, having been, having been growing up my whole life, being told I wasn't, you know, the most, the, the, the sharpest tool in the shed, you know, they always thought I was really stupid and I'd get terrible grades. And, you know, so I never had much confidence. I mean, being dyslexic and nobody understanding dyslexia for me at that moment, at that time in my life, because I would, people didn't really understand it that well. Um, I sort of credit dyslexia for getting me where I am because I was told I wasn't smart. And I was like, so I was always, I always felt like I had to work harder. Um, and then when I first got my first job, I guess I didn't really realize that I was any good at this because when you go into professional kitchens, it's the same thing as school. They kind of tell you, they'll, they'll never give you a compliment. They don't want to tell you you're doing well because then they think you're going to sit back and not do well. So a chef is always telling you to do better, do better, do better. And I can remember my, my, my chef, um, his name was David Pasternak. He was my, one of my first sous chefs. Um, and always riding me i mean it was like murphy do this murphy do that but they never said murphy do this and at the end of doing that they'd be like well you did that better than everybody else no because then you know they then you're going to get cocky or whatever right so they never really give you the compliment but i do remember there was this one moment and it was i had been working in the restaurant probably for about a year and a half and there was some big vip coming in and the executive chef was like oh we have to do this thing whatever and uh, the sous chef, David, came up from the kitchen and he's like, all right, we're going to do we're going to we're going to do this. Everybody off the line. Murphy, stay here. And I was like, I get to I get to do this VIP cooking with you. And he's like, yeah. And I did this. And that was probably the one moment I realized I was like, wait, does he think I'm better than everybody else that works here? Because he threw everybody else off the line and I was the only one cooking with him. And I was like, oh, shit, I'm good at this, maybe. And, you know, that was probably the only time. And, and soon after that. He actually sat me down and he looked at me and he goes, listen, you have to leave. And I'm like, what do you mean I have to leave? He goes, you're, you're good and you need to go learn somewhere else. And I was like, okay, what do you mean? He goes, well, because you learned pretty much everything you need to learn in this kitchen. There's nothing else for you to really learn here. And I need you to go somewhere else and learn from some other chef, from other chefs. And I was like, okay, did I just get fired? No, I just got asked to go learn more shit, <laughs> which was kind of interesting to me because it was like, that was the first time, I mean, I, I still get emotional about it because I was like, you know, I was the first time anybody ever really gave me a compliment in a certain sense. It, it's funny. I think about that moment specifically and the impact for so many different people. A lot of times it's just someone they respect or look up to essentially saying, I, I believe in you. And that little, that little shift can completely change someone. I'm really intrigued because a little while ago, you said you didn't have any confidence prior to that. After that, did you start developing confidence or is that something that's still just always on the back burner? I think it's always in the back burner. I don't think I'm ever going to be fully 100% confident. I kind of always feel like whatever I go into, it, it, I kind of cross my fingers behind my back, hoping it works, you know, kind of like, oh, geez, let's hope that this works, you know, because <laughs> I've never, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think that the confidence was never built up to me as a child. And I don't think it was a, a, something that ever, you know, it, it, it's hard to recoup from that. And I think that it also, it, it's, it's like, I always sort of explain to people when they start a new job, if you don't have butterflies in your stomach and you're not nervous and you're not really scared out of your mind going into a new job, you're probably accepting the wrong job because it's not pushing you hard enough. You know, you need to have, you, you, you can't just go in and be like, yeah, I got this, you know, because if you do, you, you, you're going to screw it up, I feel like. But if you have a little bit of like 
anxiousness and there's a little bit of oh shit kind of in the deep background you're going to work harder at it and you're going to maybe hopefully do better yeah i, I view like the, the mental image for me i'm always trying to tightrope walk on like the edge of chaos on one end and then complete comfort on the other and like you're constantly going towards the balance because if not you're, i mean your heightened awareness is not going to be up to the level you need it to be to be able to, to execute on that craft it, so are you just constantly searching for that that next element what's going to bring more of mark out of you yeah, and it's interesting now because obviously I'm older and I'm okay. I'm I'm not, you know, I'm not financially strapped and I'm not, you know, but but I still feel like I have a lot of life in me and I still need to be able to do things and I still need to be able to wake up in the morning. And it's almost like now it's a new chapter where it's a um uh what what is next? What is gonna push me farther this time? What I don't know because you know, I think that's you know, one of the main drivers in our lives is yes, financial, right? Is like to be able to you got to drive yourself to be able to support yourself, right? But then all of a sudden, when you be comfortable with that, you know, what is the next level of push, so to speak? And I, I think that actually right now, this sort of shutdown and this lockdown for a year has sort of given me a good opportunity to sort of sit back and reflect and go, okay, what's next? You know, where where am I going next? And um, it's uh, it's it's in a way scary. It's in a way exciting. I mean, I love a new beginning. You know, there's nothing better than starting over. <laughs> This could go nowhere. I'm wondering how methodical that process is. You said stepping back, reflecting. What's the lens and prism you're looking through in order to figure out what's next for you? I, th I think it comes back to where, even as a little kid, being told I was dumb and being told I wasn't smart and, you know, um, not back then, not knowing what was wrong with me, I sort of kind of sat back with myself and said, you know what? <sighs> it, there's, there's a certain point, part of me that just doesn't care. And just says to myself, I want to have fun. You know what? We're not here that long on this round marble, wherever we are at Earth, right? We're not here that long. Like, we shouldn't be miserable. We shouldn't really hate life. We should enjoy life. And I think if you start with that premise, and it's like, you know, I never wanted to do, I never, I don't think I ever did a job that I hated. I always was like, I might have, you know, worked my butt off and been a little bit, but it was difficult. But I, I always loved everything I did. And I think if you start also with that premise that you're going to enjoy what you do. And, and there was some philosopher, I think, once that said, you know, once you really find what you enjoy to do, you never really have to go to work again. It doesn't feel that way. Right. And I've always felt that every job I've had has sort of felt like that. I mean, even in my, you know, I think even in now that I do television, I'm on Chopped and I, I love doing that show because you see inspire, you inspire people, people, you, they inspire you. There's all these things. I mean, I, I've actually been so bold to say to people that, you know, I wouldn't want to do a TV show that I wouldn't want to get up in the morning to do. You know, I want something that I want. I, it's got to fulfill me as well. I think that if you're going to, it's got to fulfill your own, you know, yourself you you as well as as the other people it's kind of it's a two-way street in that sense when making big decisions like that then how much are you entrusting in your gut uh, I, i'm kind of thinking about as that spark that you feel deep down this decision's right as opposed to just being completely logical and maybe looking at it more about monetary upside and things of that nature i i don't know if you ever know 100 percent. you're always going to have doubt uh, you're always going to have doubt. You're always going to have um, questions. Um, you're never 100 percent sure until it's over, really. I mean, and that's that's the, that's the scary thing, but it's also the fun part of it, right? Are you going to take this job? Are you going to go into it? Are you going to put 100 percent? Are you going to be nervous about doing it right? All these things, sort of like, and and all those emotionals, all those pieces of emotion put together, they make you feel alive, right? That's that's what makes you that's what makes you like sort of tick. It's like, you know, get if, if you get up in the morning and you're bored at your job and you're really good at it and you're not pushing yourself and you, how do you get up in the morning? It's like, you know, making millions of dollars, woo, you know, it's like, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like fun. Or, and, and I think that I also layer on this other part of me because of, of who I am. And I was actually just talking to a friend of mine the other day. He goes, you know, you're really good at like helping other people. And I do feel like there's, an element to everybody's life that that is another sort of thing that clicks for me at least. And I think it should click for a lot of people that the good feeling about helping other people. And, and I think that if you can 
obviously the perfect world would be have a job that you're, um, you know, you're, you're passionate about that you push yourself that you're nervous about that you, you know, excel at, but also be able to help other people along the way. It's just, it's, it's a great, it's a great feeling. Mark, you're, you're hitting on some absolute gems here. The one thing I think about is, is we feel that doubt, right? Like we, we don't know how this is going to work out. And the funny thing is I always look for the, these paradoxes in life. And, and the one thing is the, the hardest times are usually the ones we've learned the most from and then have grown the most from, but we're always so unwilling to dive into those. But if we think about how we become better people, then we should be going after those opportunities and those, those unknowns that make us feel uncomfortable. So I, I love hearing you hit on that. There's, there's a great term in French. It's called forger le caractère. And forger le caractère literally means to forge the character. Like, you know, I, I just, and I just think of forging. Forging is something you do with a piece of metal on an anvil, right? You're, you're banging a piece of metal to make a stick or to make a knife or something like that, right? And, and I think that when you're, when you're struggling and when you're going through these emotions, you're forging your character. And I think that is something that is really big. It's, uh, it, it's such a great sort of term. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I collect a, a bunch of these terms in, in different languages that are just so hit home. That, that's one I, I right. have not come across. I'm going to have to add. You mentioned at the heart of you in, in terms of helping other people. And one of your friends said that that's something, Mark, that you do great. I know you, you've talked about dyslexia here. When you were coming up, this was just some unknown thing, which, which anyone who's struggling with something that can't be named is always going to be really, really hard. I know you put a lot of attention to helping others who are experiencing dyslexia right now. What, what are some of the big takeaways that you've learned and for anyone who's listening who has it that can help them on their path? Well, let me let me just sort of back up on, on, on how I got to the actual helping and the dyslexia Perfect. sort of uh, section of my life. Because uh, being on a show like Chopped and um, having a, a national stage of sorts, I've always found that whenever I mentioned about my dyslexia on Chopped, I get so much... Um, social media or emails from people saying like they're so inspired my kid is dyslexic and they saw that you're dyslexic on chopped and that's so inspiring it's great and it was like oh wow so me just mentioning this on a show that i'm dyslexic and that i'm actually successful is something that inspires people wow that's awesome right i never really knew that would be the you know you don't you don't really think of the consequences of being on a tv show and judging food judging a food show on television that it could actually hit deeper than just you know what does this onion taste like it's overcooked it's salty right it's something more and then i got involved um with brain trust which is a, a an organization that that helps kids through um uh online tutoring but they also have a, a charitable aspect to it which is something to me you know oh would you, would you like to be an ambassador and talk about your dyslexia yeah, but now, but 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 obviously, if there's a charitable aspect to it, it also fulfills another one of my needs, and it also it's it, that that's another great great part of the of the organization. So, what what was the original question? Now I've I've already forgotten. Yeah, no, no, no. That, <laughs> well, believe me, I, I appreciate you leading into how you've been thinking about it more. My my original question was just around now that you've uncovered what you have in in terms of dyslexia. What's advice for someone who's younger and dealing with dyslexia? And so making- I, yeah, so my my advice for somebody who has dyslexia and 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 well, first of all, it, it, it's sort of um, it's sort of weird to say this, but we as dyslexics think very differently than most people. Um, and I don't want to be too cocky about it, but we're much smarter than everybody else to start with. And I think that's something that people with dyslexia have to understand: not that they're dumb, not that they don't understand how to do a test because it's all written and everything like that. Because I can guarantee you that a dyslexic person can figure something else out in life much better than the other people that are really, let's say, I just call it like, you know, like book smart or whatever, like, you know, really good at, at the traditional education. We, unfortunately, we fortunately can see things in a very different way. We sort of just, we don't, we might not go straight to the answer. We might zigzag, but we're going to pick up a whole bunch of other information on the way to get there. Right. So I think that that's, that's the first thing people, young people with dyslexia have to understand that they probably are smarter than most people. Uh, It's just that they live in a society that doesn't sort of um, gear education just for them the way they, they need to learn. And there are other ways to learn and people have learned a lot more about it. So it's a matter of finding those resources and figuring out how to, how to gather that information. And it's, it's obviously a lot easier now. Um, so I guess the, 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 the thing is, is just to say, you know, you learn differently. If you're dyslexic, you learn differently. You understand things differently. 
So who cares? A lot of people have differences, right? Some people do, 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 do things differently. That's fine. So th I guess my big thing is, is like, don't worry about it. Just figure out how you can get through the, 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 the you know, get through the forest here and get to the other side and find something you love to do. You're probably going to end up being able to do it better than the other people. But, you know, it's just a matter of, of getting through it. And, and because we live in a society that has traditional education and there's one, they know a lot of schools, there's one way to learn. You have to understand, you have to look around and find other ways to do things. That's all. Is there anything that you've been able to do throughout your life and your career? Like you were just mentioning, oh, the herd's going one way. Mark, you're shifting, going somewhere completely different. Even just how to handle that? Um, I mean, the way I've handled it, I mean, personally, because I think everybody's going to find a different way, mm -hmm. is just not taking yourself too seriously. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that there's, there's, there's a certain element to the laissez-faire and not really worrying about things that helps me a lot because it's like, you know, it, it, look, look at television. Like people are like, oh, you're a cook, you're a sous chef, you're a chef. And all of a sudden you're on a TV show. Like how'd that happen? And were you comfortable? And I was like, yeah, you know what? I just didn't really care what people thought about me. And I think that helped me a lot on television because I'm just me. And that's who they wanted when they hired me to do that show. And I didn't get all, you know, deer in headlights where some people can be really good. And I mean, look, there's some people that are great chefs and great talkers of food and put a bunch of lights and cameras and makeup on them and they freeze up, right? I just didn't really care what people thought about me. And I think that helped. So maybe it's just, I mean, but that, that, that was me personally, how I dealt with it. I'm sure everybody's going to have to find their own mechanism or, or, or you know, their, their own coping mechanism in that sense. Yeah. Well, I, I think you bring up just an amazing point and it's just, I'm just me and, and no one can, can be a better mark than, than you can be. And there, there's a great line, escape competition through authenticity. And if you're true to yourself, you're, believe me, you're going you're gonna to find a way to stand out and be different. So I, I just love that. I think that really hits home. I'm wondering for you, maybe early on, were, were, were there anyone who was just incredibly influential and really shaping you? And I'm thinking about the, the skill development even in becoming a great chef. Um, I think younger years who developed me and who helped me get developed, uh, was probably my grandfather because I used to spend, uh, my grandfather was French and we'd go to the South of France every year and spend a lot of summers there. And my grandfather was an engineer for Schlaum Berger and they and, and worked on the oil fields his whole life as, a, as an engineer. So when he retired, he, you know, he basically bought a house in the South of France and he would every day get up and tinker like redo the electrical or redo this floor or redo that. He was always working and doing things. And I was, because I was a physical sort of, I wanted to, I, I learned, I did things with my hands and understood that better. I was always behind him as a little kid. Like I had my own little tool belt and I would walk around with him and help him and everything. So he taught me how to work and he taught me how to use my hands and would show me how to saw or screw things in or whatever. So that was one of my, he was probably one of the most, uh, you know, I, once again, I was doing something I could do. I could, start a task and finish it. It wasn't, you know, give me a book and finish, try to finish reading a book of the dyslexic. I was like, ah, I can't do it. But, you know, like move this pile of rocks over there as, a, you know, five, six, seven, eight, 10, 12 year old. I can do that. I can move a pile of rocks or whatever it might've been. Um, and then as, as I grew up in, in my field and in, in cooking, I mean, I had a lot of mentors. I mean, every sous chef, Every sous chef you work with, every cook you work with, every dishwasher, everybody in the restaurant industry, you're constantly absorbing information. Uh, you're, you're always learning new things. And it doesn't, I wouldn't say it would be one person. I did have one chef when I worked at Le Cirque in New York. Um, his name was Sylvain Porté. I thought he was a, uh, he was very humble. He was very, yeah, uh, he wasn't showy. He wasn't whatever, but he was an amazing cook. And he would really, he was a really good teacher and um, taught me a lot and, and taught me a lot about simplicity. And I think that that was one of the chefs. And, and by the way, it was teaching me, he taught me simplicity and he, we worked in one of the highest regarded restaurants in Manhattan. It was, Le Cirque was the pinnacle of pinnacles of restaurants. And he had actually worked at Alain Ducasse in Monte Carlo, which is a three-star Michelin restaurant. And when he came and he really sort of explained food the way he saw it, his philosophy was, it was really eye-opening to me and, 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 uh, and, and very, um, accessible to me so he was a very big influence as well can you dive deeper on uh porte's take on simplicity i'm just wondering how that applies to your field well he, he used to also he used to say things like listen if we're serving the hot food hot the cold food cold 
we're already ahead of most restaurants because <laughs> people, people aren't really, you know, let's, let's basically like, let's do a good job. Um, let's not overthink things. Let's not over manipulate ingredients where you're touching it so much. It's going to get cold before it gets out to the customer. Um, the one thing also we used to boil our stocks, which I mean, if you think about it, when I was working in France and you'd always learn that you skim your stocks, you take the fat out while you're skimming it. And then at the end, he would be like, you know, when you were working in those other restaurants and you're taking all the fat, the animal fat out and you're making it a nice, beautiful sauce. And then at the end, you mount it, you put butter in it and you whisk the butter in to give it. He's like, why don't we just use the animal fat? And and why are we adding another fat into it later? And it was, it was just interesting to me. It's like, oh my God, I never thought of that. You know, just simple things like that sometimes were like, um, you know, just eye-opening in that sense for, for me. And uh, and he'd worked for Alain Ducasse for a long time. And Alain Ducasse was like, you know, this chef from Southern France uh, had this great like Mediterranean flavors and, you know, did keep it pretty simple, but it was still, you know, it was, it was interesting. You could take complicated and fancy food and beautiful ingredients, but let's just try to keep it simple and it tastes good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the true signs of genius, right? You take the most complicated thing you can imagine and just distill it down to its simplicity. I, I, I'm always intrigued then. I, I love just watching people who are just masterful at their craft and then thinking about the early days. Was there, it could be a skill, even like a mindset early on that you just spent so much time. And then a decade later, you're like, I can't believe I put that much attention or thought to this. It, it really wasn't needed. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I see that with some of my old French training is my knife skills. Uh, you know, I, I have friends now that when I'm cooking at home, make fun of me, like I'm cutting all the carrots exactly the same size. They're like, Oh my God, you just can't get it out of you. Can you? And I'm like, Oh, you're right. Like, cause hey, what am I doing? But yeah. And, it, and to me, it's, 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 uh, it's kind of funny, but it's also therapeutic for me. Like, you know, making perfect Brunois dices when I'm making a, even if I'm making a soup and I'm just, I'm not like blending it together. It's like, hey, you know, at least they're all the same size. They cook exactly at the same time, you know, but, but yeah, I, I sometimes find myself going, oh, what, what are you doing? Okay. Let's just keep moving along. <laughs> what about on the, on the opposite end of that spectrum? Were there things you'd wish that you'd done earlier that you, that you put more attention to later? Um, I don't know if I could say that. I think that my only, no, my only sort of regret of my cooking career is that I didn't do, that maybe I became a chef too early. I was a chef at like 26 or 27 years old and I didn't. And the problem with becoming a chef is you can't go work for other people um, and, and absorb their knowledge. And I think that there's, uh, there's, there's a difference between reading a book or going to a restaurant and eating and, and studying somebody else's cuisine. But there is, there's that way of doing it, but being a line cook for that cook, for that chef, you just learn the nitty gritty and you learn the beginning and end of everything. And like, for example, I, I, I was, I, you know, one of my dreams was always like, I had actually pitched a show. I thought about doing a show where you get in a plane and you go somewhere and you get off the plane and there's a line cook that meets you there with his list of stuff he's got to do before service. And you go to the restaurant and you prep and you stand next to this guy or girl for three days and watch them cook their station because a restaurant, when you're cooking a station, you're cooking, you're, you're, you know, you're um, doing five or six dishes during the service. And then the, the person next to you is doing that. And you really learn that station. And then all of a sudden at one point that cook, leaves and you have to take over the station and you've got to know every dish top to bottom flavor size you know viscosity of the sauce like all this stuff you got you know that dish perfectly and i always thought this would be really fun and then one of my friends was like hey, we're too we're too old for that man that's really hard because it's it's <laughs> it's physically it's physically um it's it's physically demanding being a line cook and and it's uh it's it's a uh, it's tough but i loved it i used to i i used to love getting set up for service making sure my knife was here, my spoon was here, my clean water, my this was here, all my lamb or whatever my station had was below in the refrigerator and my sauces were perfectly set up and I was set up for success. And I was that there's no, there's no better feeling than, than working a station like that. And so maybe I regret just having not been able to do that longer, although I did do it for many, many years, <laughs> but it was just fun. Mark, I mean, that's just such a refreshing take, right? Like mentioning you, you worked, so you were 26. That's when you became a chef and 
yeah, that was too early where, where now people are saying 26, like, wait, wait a second. I, I haven't, I haven't figured life out and I, I haven't accomplished everything I want to accomplish. It, it makes me uh, think of the, uh, that documentary, Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Have you seen that? Oh man, where the guy who's making, he's, he's not, allowed, he's not allowed to make the rice until he's 60. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it, it's honestly, it's, it's a, like a multi-decade process. <laughs> Just that, that training. Totally, I, I, totally. I, I mean, I, but, but, but that's it. But that's the thing is even when I became a chef, I mean, I turned my first chef's job down three times. I wouldn't take it. And then finally they're like, oh, well, you know, you have to take it. I'm like, I don't want to. I'm not good enough yet. I'm not ready. But I ended up getting talked into it. And, and I did. And I, I was happy I did it. But I was also, all right, you know, it, it, it came at, the, at a weird time for me. I felt like I was too young. I hadn't been a sous chef long enough, but I was I did it. I was, you know, my, my old friend sort of talked me into it or forced me to take the job. <laughs> I'm wondering, you were talking about just having your station set up and prepared. I'm wondering for you, is there anything, I, I think of the analogy of like a basketball player practicing their free throws or even a great penis practicing their scales every single day. Is there anything that you do just to stay on top of your game? I mean, um, I, I have a much, much uh, different outlook on this, on, on my craft because I have to do what I do every day. I have to eat. <laughs> So, so to me, it's, uh, it, 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 it is even, even if I'm by myself, like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just go make myself lunch. I will do something. I will, you know, and to me, that's, that is, a, I'm just practicing my skill, but my skill, there's always a means to my end, the end, because it means I get to eat something good. You know, I was, I, I love that. You know, that's the great thing about my, my craft is I get to do it over and over. And there's a reason. And, and the other thing that's great about my craft is, and I understand like a pianist will, will play and people will enjoy it. But for me, it's like, you know, it, what I do, I can watch the people enjoy it around the table afterwards. Like you can see it in their face right there. And it's just immediate gratification. That's, that's the one thing that I always loved about, you know, my industry is the immediate gratification. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's wonderful. You don't have to, what always kills me is like, you know, some scientist that sits in a lab for four years to come up with something. And then four and a half years later, they go, ta-da. It's like, I would be like, oh my God, I've been, you know, I, I, I that, that to me, that concept of waiting four years to have your dish made, so to speak, it's like, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. There, there, there's something to be said about when, when you prepare something right there and whether it's your family, friends, or even people you don't know, and just seeing the satisfaction on their face, I can only imagine at the, at the level you're doing it at how satisfying, how gratifying that must be. Uh, I'm intrigued about the transition. And you talk about like running towards your edges, what you're incapable of figure, to figure out what you're capable of. What about in the decision to open your own restaurant? I can only imagine the amount of stress, effort, time, energy, everything that goes into that. What was that process like? You know, I always say that being a line cook, you, you sort of training all the time for being a restaurant owner or opening your own restaurant. Because when you're a line cook, you're doing probably six to 10 things at the same time all the time, right? You're, you got one rack of lamb in the back of the oven. You've got a, you know, the vegetables over here cooking. You've got this and you've got, you're listening to orders as they're coming in. It's like three more racks, medium rare, well done. Blah, blah, blah. You're, you're constantly thinking of, you're constantly doing it. And when you're running a restaurant in the end, you're doing the same thing. You got, you know, you got the cooks over here. You got the deliveries coming in. You've got the accountant calling on the phone. You've got the the press you have to talk to, you've got the customers coming in, you've got the, the, the bartender that called out sick, you've got the this call. So you're, you, it's, it's a, just another, it's just a bigger expanse of having eight to 12 things going on at the same time. And, and, and as is in the restaurant business, as you work your way up, you're constantly relying on other people of what you've taught them to be able to keep going. So when you're a, 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 a kumi, which is like a, you know, the lower end of the kitchen where you're being a, you know, prepping things or whatever, a prep cook, then you become a, uh, a line a line cook and you've got the prep cook to look after because he's prepping your stuff for your station. And if your station's not ready, it's your fault, right? And then when you become a sous chef, you're now in charge of the kitchen and all the things going on. And if the guy on the meat station is not ready, the chef's going to look at you and go, why isn't the meat? You're the sous chef. It's your fault. And, and it's a hierarchy, right? And then when you become the chef, anything that goes wrong in the kitchen is your fault. It doesn't matter if you didn't even, we weren't even working that day. It's your fault. Um, and then as an owner, you become 
anything that happens, you know, the toilet backs up and it leaks on the store below you, it's your fault. The customer gets a steak that's well done and it was supposed to be medium rare, it's your fault. So you, you, you end up having this like, so what you do as a chef, as a line cook or as a, somebody in our industry is you learn how to teach the people below you really well because you know it's going to be your fault. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's really about um, building a team that you trust and that you know will do what they need to do. And I always used to say it when I had, you know, I had at one point about 600 employees, five restaurants. Um, I, I used to say to people, I was like, we're all adults here. Everybody's just got to do their job. And mm -hmm. Let's, and there was another thing that I always used to say, especially for front of the house staff, is let's not hire people that know everything that they're doing and that they're perfect at what they're doing. Let's hire people that are nice and then teach them how to do things. Because there's one thing I can't teach people is how to be nice. I can teach people how to wait tables or I can teach people how to cook, but I can't teach them how to be nice. You know, and so it's like, you know, if you're, if you're starting with that premise, um, you're, you're much better off. <laughs> I, I actually want to hear you talk about a little bit more about talent development because I think about this the, the lens with some of the businesses I'm I'm operating is we look for those people that we can train those skills up but they're so soft skills that you, you either have it or you don't. What else are you looking for when you're thinking about the complete build out of your team? Because I know team is just something you focus on a tremendous amount. Yeah, I mean you you, you focus on loyalty. I think you focus on people that that. Um... I mean, you want people to be loyal to you. You want people that can absorb information. You want people that can think outside the box and sort of think differently. You want people that will speak up too. I used to get terribly upset when I'd sit around the table with, you know, all my sous chefs or something and somebody wouldn't share with me something that they knew. It's like, are you, what, you know, if I was sitting around the table with all my sous chefs. I'd be like, we have a hundred years of cooking experience in this room. I only have X amount of how many I've ever been cooking. I mean, I want to draw from everybody's experience and put those ideas on the table. Why are we holding back? I remember one time, it was the silliest thing. That one of my managers was like, oh yeah, I was thinking of that a long time ago. Why, why, why we didn't do that? I was like, well, why didn't you say something? And it was, I could still remember the moment. We used to have, we used to have a lot of kids at my restaurant at Landmark. We had a lot of kids there. And we used to have these kids menus. And we also used to hand out these pieces of paper with a thing on the back and some crayons for the kids to draw on. And they're like, why don't we just put the drawing on the back of the menu and give them the crayons? So we just use one piece of paper. I was like, well, that makes complete sense. That's the stupidest thing I never thought of. But why didn't you say something earlier? You know, we could have saved a lot of paper. But it was just sort of funny. It was like one of those moments where it's like, share. I want my team to share with me. I want people to under. I want people to tell me if I'm wrong. I'm not. I, I always tell people, you don't work for me. We work together. And that's that's a very important difference of somebody working for you or working with you. And, and, and if people work together with you. It, it just makes the experience more pleasant and it makes it more um, open relationship, I think, in a certain sense. Yeah, really cultivates and, and fosters that environment that allows these ideas to flow. Yeah, uh, I'm wondering no, about you're, not, you're, gonna, you're gonna hear some stupid advice too. Yeah. Don't worry about it. You're gonna hear some really <laughs> stupid ideas, but it's actually interesting because even having a stupid idea and you explaining to them why it's a stupid idea, well, might spark another idea, right? It, 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 it just creates a conversation and you get to create a way to be able to understand each other. And that person will then, if they've come up with a stupid idea, they're not going to sit there in, in the back of their mind and go, well, if they did it this way, it would be really good. But if you have that conversation, they're going to be like, they're not going to think that. They're going to be like, oh, he explained to me why that's not a good idea. So I'm just going to do it the way that, that we're doing it now because he actually makes sense and it is works better this way. And it was explained to me why my idea was stupid. Not that you have to say somebody's a stupid idea, but you, you can explain to them why you think this is working better. And they go back and think about it and you'll see it come back sometimes and go, oh, you're right. You know, I understand why that idea doesn't work as well. And that's, that, that, that's clarity. And I think clarity is a good, that's a good term too for, uh, for team building. Clarity is great. Yeah, clarity is a hell of a thing. Uh, I'm wondering when you're exploring your own stupid ideas, I mean, I've, I've got a million of them. It's always fun to look at them. What about around, this could be new recipes, new restaurant concepts, things like that. What is your idea generation process like? Because you're, you are a creative. So I'm wondering how you approach this. I mean, luckily for me, cooking wise, I mean, it's easy to try something and make a mistake and throw it out. It's not like it's a, it's a big deal, right? So it's the experimentation. Built, you, know? you have to experiment. I mean, you, you can, I mean, I've put things on paper before that I'm like, this is going to be the best thing ever. This is going to be so good. And then you, you taste it and you're like, well, this sucks. 
<laughs> How did I screw this up so bad? It doesn't need, you know, there's way too much, you know, acid in here. There's way too many, too much salt or whatever the case would be too many salty things. And the balance isn't right. I mean, luckily I've been, I, I, I know, I know what I like. So that, that does help. Um, and as far as like, bigger picture things um that, that that i'm still exploring right now because obviously i don't have any more restaurants right now they're all they're, luckily i closed everything before the pandemic started so that was i got lucky there uh but um i don't know what my next move is or, or if i am what what i'm doing so i think right now i'm just sort of I'm, I'm making a lot of phone calls i'm exploring different ideas maybe even television show concepts and, and book things and all, all these other things but now it's a matter of you know, flushing them out, talking to people and, you know, having conversations with myself as well. I, I'm intrigued for you then. I, I always think about like assessing our own skills for you now that, that you've done things in multiple names, meaning being a chef, being on TV, having your own podcast. What do you, what do you feel like your biggest strengths are right now? Uh, I think experience. I have, uh, I have the, I have now the dubious distinction of being the older guy in the room sometimes with younger people, colleagues, and I have the, I have the experiences to share with them or the stories that go with them to let them sort of, um, you know, you, you, you try to project those types of things to other people and try to help them not make mistakes or like I had a, a chef friend of mine who was telling me about this concept that he wants to do and so on and so forth. And it, it, I was like, that sounds great, but you know, they wanted to be reviewed. They wanted to get, you know, love to get a mission star, but they wanted to be a private club. And I was like, you understand that private clubs are not allowed to be reviewed because the public can't go to them. He's like, oh my God, I never thought of that. Like it was just one of those things that as a young, as a young cook or a young chef or young person in business, it's like you sometimes you get so excited about stuff, you forget about the basics. It's like, oh wait, yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> you know? So I guess. You know, experience is something I've got going for me to be able to, and, 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 and as I said before, this whole clarity thing and sharing, I think that's amongst ourselves, amongst our peers, and we should all share. And I think that's something that I can do with people. Uh, I'm thinking about people who are younger in their career. What point did you really develop that clarity and realize that you actually had experience that really was a strength for you? I think it's just starting to come into play, I guess, because people now people talk to me and people ask for, for advice sometimes and things like that. So it's something that I've, I've never, as I said, even with my earlier on, I was saying my confidence has never been that great. So I, I do I do I feel myself, a, a, you know, perfect on that? No, but uh, I, I think I'd like to consider myself as a as, as somebody that can give that thing. But no, I don't know when I had that. There was no moment when I thought, oh, no, I'm that guy. I think you just sort of, it's, it's, I'm me and I just keep developing and I keep moving forward. Yeah. I love that, Mark. You said it earlier, being, being the best version of you. I'm just me. We're, we're going to round it out here in a minute. I, I am f uh, curious, a few ones I'm, I'm really intrigued about. What for you has been the single best meal you've had? Oh boy. I mean, I, I don't know if I can pinpoint that in this certain, and, and there's a couple, there's a couple reasons here is because and I always said this to my to my staff and to my my people. Uh, you know, it's when you're eating, it's not just about it, it. Look, as a chef, you think it's all about the food. It's not just about the food. It's about the lighting. It's about the music. It's about the company. It's about this place where you at or where you are in your life. Um, I, I can guarantee you. You know, I I remember one time a waitress comes in the back in the kitchen. She goes, I don't know. I like practically in tears. I can't make these people happy. I can't make these people happy. And she was, and I said to her, I said, okay, is the food hot? We, we've done everything we can do. I said, you know what? You have to realize maybe that person is actually having dinner with their future ex-husband and they hate each other. And by the way, that's going to be the shittiest meal of their life. Doesn't matter if we gave them sparkles every time they took a bite. It doesn't really matter because that meal is going to take, they'll never come back here for one because this is going to be a bad memory place. And, and they're not even going to remember what they ate. It doesn't matter. So um, I, I, I guess it's, it's tough. It's tough to decide which was my favorite meal because there's obviously, you know, the, you know, the first couple of meals you meet with somebody who you fall in love with. I mean, you could have been eating a bologna sandwich. It doesn't matter, right? So, um, but food food wise, I mean, most of my great meals, I've, I've had memorable ones. I mean, Italy or probably, you know, anywhere in Italy, really. I love, I love Italy. I love Italian food. I love the, 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 the casualness of restaurants there. There's really, it's, um, 
But no, I guess, you know, there's certain dishes that have stuck out, stuck out in my mind, like a, a raspberry souffle I had, I think, when I was 12 years old at this restaurant in the south of France or, um, you know, or even working for a chef. Daniel Boulud used to make this thing called, it was a um, scallop. We used to slice it thin and put a piece of truffle in between each and then blanch spinach and wrap it around and wrap that in puff pastry and baked it in the oven and serve that with a truffle sauce. I used to like, I used to love making those because sneak one in every once in a while like <laughs> a lot yeah, of different a lot, lot of different there's a lot of different dishes like that in my in my mind that pop up no that's, that's a great answer uh we, we've actually had chef balut on and uh after our interview is in person uh so restaurant was closed everything like that and he uh he just whipped up this unbelievable meal with just whatever was around uh it, it was one of the the best experiences uh, i've had I, I'm always intrigued. So, so my wife is obsessed with with Chopped and a lot of the shows you're on. And she's always wondering when you're watching other chefs and it doesn't have to be only on the shows. Do you have a pretty good idea of how good the meal is going to turn out based on just how you see them operate in the kitchen? Or do you have no idea until you taste it? There are sometimes there's flavor combinations that you don't really understand or have not had before that you can be surprised at. Uh, like I remember one guy made something, he put tarragon and leeks. And I was like, who puts tarragon and leeks? I've never seen that. And then when I tasted it, I was like, whoa, I want to put tarragon in my leeks, right? Um, so there are moments like that. But then as a, as a professional chef, you know, you'll see somebody put like too many chicken thighs in a pan and you can see from far away, the pan's not hot enough. You're like, that's never going to get crispy. Like that, that's just boiling in there. That's not going to turn out nice. And, mm -hmm. and so there's technique wise, you can see creatively flavors it's something it's harder to detect until it actually i mean look if somebody's putting you know i don't know strawberries in my pasta i can guarantee you that's going to taste terrible but i you know that that you know bar going totally ridiculousness um you you can you have to really let your palate hop in and be the judge on that yeah Gotcha. I, I was always intrigued by that. So final one here before we wrap up, uh, I'm wondering if you could do something like this similar, an evening of just having a great conversation with someone dead or alive, just not a family member or friend, who would you love just spending an evening having a conversation with? You know, I, I get this question a lot of who do you want to have a meal with? And, and, and for some reason, I've always thought Winston Churchill would be really fun because uh, not only he, he looked like he was like a guy who liked to eat and, you know, <laughs> And, uh, and 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 uh, incredibly intelligent and would have um, really good conversation and and it would go on a long time because we'd have a cigar and a cognac afterwards which would be the proper way to end an evening around the i can just i could just picture like a, a really you know a really good meal uh, a really great conversation and um and extends into uh, into the evening hours with uh and god he must have had some great stories it's like i i find that you know talking to people that are older and, and getting their advice and getting their stories sometimes are just, it, it's, it's so precious. Uh, as, as you, as I told you, you know, being dyslexic, I'd rather listen to somebody's stories than to read about a history book. Cause I'm not that good at reading. Right. So listening to somebody, you know, having an oral history from somebody who's actually sitting in front of you who's had those experiences. There's that's, that's just, there's nothing better. That's just delicious. <laughs> I love that. I, Churchill, someone that, that I've learned a tremendous amount from, I would love to have been able to sit down with him, but that's what, it's one of the reasons I, I love this medium, the, the podcast, right? Like you're someone who's accomplished a lot and you have so much to share. So for me, this is just an, an absolute pleasure. I, I would love to make sure the listeners, because I know we've had some people reach out uh, when we found out you were coming on, where they can go just to be more in the where with what you're doing and then also what you do with brain trust tutors, um, just so we can kind of keep them in the loop and everything there. Where should um, people go? The, the, the most immediate gratifying way to find out what I'm doing, and what's going on in my life is my Instagram account. I mean, Instagram is where I, I do most of my <clears throat> putting word out of like whenever I'm going to be on a TV show or if I'm doing a new project or something's coming out. Instagram, it's uh, at Chef Mark Murphy. Um, that's pretty much the best place to go. Um, um, and uh, yeah, I think that's the way most people communicate these days. It's sort of funny because it's, people used to have business cards before. Now they have Instagram accounts. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Chef, I can't thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. Oh, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.